Um, welcome to a special edition of Hofstra University's Great Writers, Great Readings series. My name is Dina Santarelli. I'm an author of suspense novels and thrillers. I'm also a graduate of Hofstra University. I received both my bachelor's degree and master's degree from Hofstra. I am coming to you tonight from sunny Long Island, New York, where we're wrapping up a beautiful spring day. And I'm honored to have the opportunity to chat today with award-winning author, Martha McPhee, who will be giving us a sneak preview of her latest novel, An Elegant Woman, which will be published on June 2nd by Scribner. Martha is also a Hofstra creative writing professor and happens to be my former advisor. It was while studying with Martha, I can't believe it's been more than 10 years, um, that I began what would become my debut novel, Baby Grand. So Martha, this really is a thrill for me to be here with you. Well, it is a thrill for me to be here with you and thank you so much for doing this. I am, um, it, it means so much when a student goes off into the world and <laughs> publishes a book and multiple books and has a successful career in the field that you were guiding that student in. So I am honored myself. Ah, thank you. Um, tonight's discussion will be an hour in length. Um, a quick outline on how the evening will go, although I'm sure by now all of you are pros at this Zoom thing. Uh, Martha will read a short passage from An Elegant Woman, after which she and I will chat about the book. And then we'll be opening up the discussion to all of you with a Q&A. So if, as we go along, you would like to ask Martha a question, please write it in the chat section and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And now without further ado, An Elegant Woman, Martha's fifth novel is a story of discovery and reinvention. It follows one woman over the course of the 20th century, taking the reader from a drought stricken farm in Montana to a yellow Victorian in Maine, from the halls of a psychiatric hospital in London to a wedding gown fitting at Bergdorf Goodman. Framed by the efforts of Isadora, a novelist, to retell her grandmother's journey and understand her own, the novel is an evocative exploration of the stories we tell ourselves and also what we leave out. An Elegant Woman received a starred review from Booklist, which said, quote, McPhee elevates the generational saga into a dazzling, artfully detailed presentation of self-determination, women's responsibilities, and freedoms. Kirkus Reviews says of an elegant woman, quote, delicately rendered characters inform a richly textured family portrait. An elegant woman is available for pre-order where fine books are sold. We will have a link in the chat section momentarily to Martha's site that you can use to find the book at your favorite retailer. And now I give the stage to author Martha McPhee, who will read a passage from an elegant woman. Thank you. Thank you. So as it happens, the, the, the hardcover, the books, it just arrived in the mail yesterday. And so I'm, I'm really thrilled. Um, it's always special to hold your book for the first time. So I won't be able, to, I, I, I haven't done this before, I confess. I've not read um, on Zoom. I've never given a Zoom reading before. So I am gonna read briefly, and I'm gonna read um, two sh short passages uh, from the beginning of the novel and then from the second chapter. And I'll just jump right in since it's the opening. The first chapter is called, What Would You Like When I'm Dead and Gone? For as long as I could remember, my grandmother was dying and telling stories. I'm just a candle in the wind, she would say, and clutch her heart, sighing audibly. I'm just an old threadbare mule going round and round the Katy did. She grew up in Montana, but a long road had deposited her in a gunquit Maine and into a yellow Victorian she had christened after my grandfather died and in a moment of virtuosic melodrama last morrow. My grandmother had snow white hair that she wore like a crown. Her exacting eyes were a startling emerald. Her large, sturdy frame seemed a fitting home for her strong opinions. She dressed impeccably in tailored suits, wore motoring gloves, netted hats, diamonds from Tiffany's. Her snakeskin pocketbook fastened with a golden clasp, and when opened, the cinnamon scent of dentine wafted from within. 
On the dashboard of her black Lincoln Continental was a golden nameplate that read Mrs. Charles Mitchell Brown, another name in a long line of borrowed names. She was Tommy, she was Catherine, she was mother, she was Mrs. Brown, she was Aunt Thelma, she was Grammy. She wanted to live forever, or at least outlive Nancy Cooper Slagle, her great-grandmother, who lived to be 104 years old. In the scheme of things, Grammy almost made it. She lived and lived and lived. Despite all the clutching of her chest, the rolling back of her eyes, the repetition of that candle in the wind, her own imminent demise became another yarn to spin. But she lived on and on. My sister Scarlet, deadpan but admiring just the same, called her a blowtorch in the wind. To protect against oblivion, the methods of two ancient Greek historians compete. Thucydides, the dominant example, tracked people down and interviewed them, took notes, recorded facts, and Herodotus, the long discredited fabulist whose allegiance was to a good yarn, sometimes involving gods walking among the place, giving a nudge to events. The thing about Herodotus is that you don't need paper, you just need to keep talking, and on the backs of a multitude of voices the narrative is carried, like the soft shirt rustle of an afternoon breeze across eternity. When my three older sisters and I would visit, Grammy would take us on tours of last morrow, showing us the melodeon that had been around the horn twice, a china bowl belonging to Nancy, Nancy Cooper Slagle, cousin of James Fenimore Cooper, she would say, telling us how Nancy had carried the bowl over the Allegheny Mountains as she fled the Confederate South during the Civil War. Her husband had died in Libby Prison, leaving her, a penny, leaving her penniless, a Yankee widow with seven children. She carried the bowl given to her as a wedding present from Richmond to the safety of her husband's family in Ohio. Grammy wanted us to hear these things. She would pause in her stories, ask one of us girls to get her smelling salts. I feel faint, she would say. And from her vanity, one of us would snatch the small silver container filled with ammonia so she'd keep telling her stories. With a sniff of it, she'd sit up straight again, the bulk of her with those green, green eyes, eyes that could hold a child mid-breath between the future and the past. I'm not long for this world, she'd say like a prophet. You need to know from where you came and to whom you belong. That was the sound of history. This is the sound of history. Like the catalog of ships in the Iliad, you are not expected to remember particular names, only the sound of the names rolling along as you listen to the poem. Every history is a song, and this is what ours sounds like. Okay, and then I'm just gonna skip ahead a bit to the beginning of chapter two. That's the one thing that's missing with these Zoom conferences. Oh. <laughs> But um, I'm, I'm going to read just a little bit from the opening of chapter two, just to show you a, a tiny bit of the variety, and then um, we will talk about it, Dina and I. But here I go back basically 100 years. It's called Magic City. Two sisters, one beautiful, the other not. Little girls, five and three years old. They wore red velvet Christmas dresses and rabbit furs waiting on the platform with their mother and her violin for, this, for the train that would take them from Ohio to Billings, Magic City as it was called, because it blossomed overnight. They were running away from father. It was January, cold, a black trunk stood between them, brass buckled, leather strapped, more suited for an ocean liner, wheels at the corners almost too heavy for the three to lift. They didn't bring much, summer dresses, white linen, eyelet and lace, lovely and impractical, which made the girls wonder if it might be warm where they were headed, an iron, rosin for the bow, ribbons for their hair, family keepsakes, a Cantonese wedding bowl, temples notes to Shakespeare, belonging to mother's grandmother, Nancy Cooper Slagle, a reminder of to whom they belonged and from where they came. The eldest of the two girls was my grandmother, pudgy and round, considered herself mostly six. Thelma Madeline Stort was named for the title character of a best-selling novel by Marie Corelli. Her middle name 
was for one of mother's sisters who died of sepsis when she was seven, a notion that scared Thelma, afraid that fight fate might befall her. Thelma had always been called Tommy, like a boy, as mother would say, as if that were better, and sometimes Tommy, Tommy thought it might be. The younger girl was Catherine, etched delicately as filigree, named for queens. Way back there at the beginning of it all, Tommy stood with her arms long at her side, shivering, her green eyes studying the dark morning, the lonely tracks shooting out ahead and behind, the gray smoky light and the quiet rectangle of the depot against the widening sky, snow on the ground, her breath making clouds. A tired dog lumbered along, leaving prints in the snow, and Tommy imagined the dog was heading home. She waited for the sound of the train, hoping that her father might just appear in, in time to stop them, wondering what would become of them if he didn't. In her purse, mother held $100, had counted it out for the girls, wanting them to know that she'd saved it over the last year, that you couldn't buy anything for $100, but that she intended to buy a new life. The money had dazzled Tommy, paper and coins tucked powerfully now in mother's purse. She had sewn some extra coins that uh, Tommy imagined were worth a lot, a private stash for emergencies, into the hem of her dress, so if thieves tried to steal from them, they'd have insurance. Quiet, Mother snapped, making Tommy flinch, though she hadn't said a word. A telegrapher for the railroads, Father kept travel passes which Mother had stolen from him. She was going to the drier climate to cure her tuberculosis an illness that she did not have. They had left him at the crack of dawn, asleep in bed with his lover. He has a wandering eye, mother had said to Tommy. Mother filched the passes, sent the trunk to the terminal the day before, left a note stating that the drier climate would be better for her, her health. I'm as strong as an ox, she told Tommy, but he doesn't need to know. I'll leave it there. It's funny, um, you know, since you're reading from the opening of the book and um, hearing it again, having read the book, it's just, it really, um, I, you know, you see a lot of the themes uh, that, ha that occur throughout the book. Um, I want to go to something you said from the first reading. Um, Grammy says, you need to know where you came from. And I thought we could start there. I thought we could begin the discussion um, with where this book came. This book was 10 years in the making. Um, when did you first conceive the idea for An Elegant Woman? When I first um, knew my grandmother, <laughs> as a very <laughs> little girl. She, so many years, in fact, when I, when I've, um, I've been recently looking at old journals and e even when I'm a little girl, I'm taking notes uh, from stories that my grandmother had been telling me. When I went to, um, when I started, uh, when I went to graduate school and was writing a first novel, I actually, in the journals from that period, what, um, was, you know, trying to sort through how to tell the story. Um, but it was a, a very, I, I could tell back then that I, I didn't have enough life experience to write the story. That it was, I always knew I wanted to cross the 20th century with it because her life had. And um, I, so I, I wasn't ready. So I, I wrote something else and then I wrote something else and then <laughs> I wrote something else. And actually my fourth novel, I, I, I sold um, my third and my fourth novel together. And th there was one sentence for the fourth novel and it was the story of a woman's life across the 20th century, but another novel got in the way. Um, ah. Yeah, and then once I had published that, I actually took two years. I was working on a different project and um, that had to do with memoir and recipes. And I went on sabbatical and, and, and something just sparked in me. And I realized it was, it was now. And I be, the novel began with the, the two girls getting on the train. And um, so it, it took eight years to actually write, but oh, it, wow. it, I've been thinking about it since I was a girl. Now, um, how much of the novel is based on true events? Well, you know, uh, it, it, a lot of the novel is based on true on, on on stories that my grandmother told me. So she was a storyteller, and she, in fact, her name um, was Thelma Thelma Stewart. I, I didn't change her, her name or Glenna's name. They were to me. They were. Um, 
fictional characters, even though I knew my grandmother, she was trying to make of her life, um, make it mythic, make herself a myth. And it, she would spin these stories. They just came off of her. It was the most incredible thing to see as a little, as, as a young woman, as a child, as I was, I think um, I was 30 when she died. So she, there were many years of her telling me these stories. And um, yet what they were breadcrumbs basically, because wh what are they? They're little, at, you know, little things you write down in your, in your journal um, or on a scrap of paper and stick away. Um, they're not, I wasn't, you know, fully composing anything early on that has made it into this book, just her stories. And in fact, you know, she would tell us about going to Montana as a little girl. And I, so I always knew that story. But with her, you, ever, you, you didn't know what was fact or fiction. In fact, she told us for a long time, for most of my life, I believed that I was descended from Buster Brown, Buster Brown shoes. And I would tell people, if my um, kids, when they were little and the parents and it would come up, you know, where, uh, oh yeah, we come from Buster Brown and James Fenimore Cooper. And I learned along the way that none of that is true. Um, we didn't. My, <laughs> my grandfather, he, they were shoemakers um, and their last name was Brown. And he was a, um, a figure in Buster Brown um, advertisements in the paper. So there was always just enough um, you know, detail that could lend authenticity to the, you know, to the fabrication. And so, uh, but the novel was never a, a, a way to go and explore fact or fiction, but more to maybe celebrate or not even celebrate, but to explore storytelling and what it, why, why was she turning her life into a myth? What, what did, what was she trying to accomplish in that? And what was storytelling for her were some of the questions I was, I guess, asking as I launched it. So, Did you ever have the urge to write it as a memoir as opposed to a novel? No, um, no because I'm a fiction writer. Mm -hmm. um, I, no, not at all. Because I, I think, and I have not read, uh, written a memoir yet. I've written lots of magazine articles that are memoir based and actually when I was this book was a struggle at various times and I would pause and I actually started um, a, a, a memoir about my relationship with my father actually but um, but I, I, I first of all I be I become, um, as a novelist I can um, go into different points of view I can explore you know, use fictional techniques. I can be, um, you know, obviously I'm looking for, you know, truth and the human condition and what it means to be alive. Um, but with the, you know, there's just a lot more flexibility with the novel. I, I couldn't write this as a memoir because it would have been my grandmother's memoir, but mm. perhaps in some ways I'm writing my grandmother's memoir by writing fiction. Um, I'm often asked how I come up with names in my novels. Um, I tend to pull them out of thin air a lot of the time. Um, I was going to ask what, how did you decide on the names, um, in this novel? And what I found so fascinating was the character names change as the novel progresses. You, you, you refer to it in, the, in, in your, in your reading. For example, your grand, the grandmother character Thelma is called Tommy, but then Tommy decides to become Catherine and Catherine decides to become Pat. Um, and there's those kinds of playing with different types of names and, and the evolution of names. So I left my grandmother's name alone because I loved it. Thelma, I loved that she was named for this um, novel that her mother had enjoyed, but that her mother um, didn't want to call her Thelma, gave her the name of a boy. And um, But identity in the novel is very important. First of all, I, 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 this is a novel about w women. It's the, the arc of the, 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 the elegant woman, my, gra the, my grandmother based on my grandmother, um, lives almost a hundred years in the novel. And around her are many generations, both past and future, that um, at least four generations, possibly five or six, um, 
that and and it's all the women um and that's not an accident either because when when my grandmother was telling me these stories it was always the women it was the, the very my grandfather figured in occasionally but mainly it was the women's stories and one of the things that and this is getting away from your questions a, a little bit but one of the things that intrigued me about um this you know the stories that she told um was uh, and um the idea of the novel was the, the a woman's life against the backdrop of big history and so much changed for women in the 20th century and she was always spinning these stories about about women and i i wanted to look at that the little the the small details of a life of a unhistoric life against a big backdrop in my grandmother's situation she was taken west and um, I was getting at this earlier, but it, um, didn't finish the thought, um, in 1910. And I, when she told the story, she didn't let me know why, you know, why they went to Montana. But as I started following her breadcrumbs, I discovered that in 1909, there was the Enlarged Homestead Act of 1909. And the railroads were basically trying to get people to come to Montana to populate it. And um, so people were, were going um, out there and they were uh, staking a claim to the land. And if they could prove up in five years, they could take the, own their farm. My, grand, my great grandmother, Glenna, didn't um, try to do that, but she did want to take advantage of that movement west and knew she would have work as a school teacher. Um, because they would need them. If they have families, they're going to have kids and the kids are going to need to go to school. So I discovered this um, along the way. Um, in the case of, you know, my grandmother and the story that I was telling of hers and the switching of names and everything, there's a lot of reinvention that's going on in these women's lives. And they're constantly trying on new identities, taking identities from each other and to reinvent themselves and move forward um, in, you know, in time and status and geography. And so it, it seemed that, um, that it was the right thing to, it was, it was natural. She, my, in the story, and actually also in life, my grandmother took her sister's name and went east. And ah. uh, so things worked out very well for her. She didn't have a high school education. So she, she couldn't, she wanted to better herself. You know, she wanted to go to nursing school. And so she, um, her, she had raised her little sister and the little sister had the high school diploma. So um, my character takes it and mm -hmm. my grandmother took it. And, um, and I get to, I, you know, the job of the novelist is to imagine all of this. I wasn't there, um, but I could put myself there through the writing of fiction. But that's why they change their names all the time. And then I, there's, there are a few other name changes, um, but, uh, Primarily, it's her daughter who, for a summer, calls her her name is Winter, but she calls right. her Pete. Um, <laughs> I, I think she's just trying that on for fun, but she's also aware that her mother is um, is Thelma, but calls herself Catherine. So it's right. probably mixed up in that as well. I'd love to talk a little bit about um, the title, "An Elegant Woman." Um, there's a line early on that Glenna, Tommy's mother, says. She tells her daughters referring to the people of the West, they want elegant people. And what did she mean by that? And why did you decide to call this book an elegant woman? Okay. Um, well, when they did, when the railroads were bringing people out, they did want elegant people. They wanted, you know, nice, you know, they wanted educated people. They wanted upstanding citizens. And so it was, it was part of the advertising. They'd go, all the way to Europe to, to try to um, populate the West um, in this way. So elegant people stuck in my mind because um, this character is always trying to improve herself. She wants to be, she, she's an impoverished kid who wants to get out of there and to have a better life. And 
so I, um, my mother had had hip replacement surgery and she was convalescing in the hospital. And I told her she was in a beautiful silk um, dressing gown. And it, uh, she was walking down the corridors of this hospital with all these other, you know, old retire, you know, people recovering from things. And there's some, there were a lot of men and in wheelchairs and stuff, and they were looking at her. And I told her that what I was thinking of is the title. I said, what do you think about elegant people? And she said, no, it should <laughs> be an elegant woman. <laughs> and that's how it happened. Ah, it just, I love it. it. Suddenly, my mother's there. She's elegant. All these eyes are on her. And then I thought of, you know, my grandmother, and that was her aspiration was to be an elegant woman. And that's what the, the character is trying to achieve. And, um, you know, whether she does or not is um, up to the reader to decide. Um, I'd love to take actually a question we have from someone who's attending because um, it does reference your grandmother. It says, how many grandchildren did your grandmother have? Uh, for you to have that love of her stories, I wondered how you came to spend so much time with her. Oh, um, I was her, we were very, very close. I, I have, my, my grandmother had a lot of, um, well, my mother had five daughters. Let's just start there. And then there were, she had two children and he had uh, her, my mother's brother had four children, but the, the, the five of us um, were very close with my grandmother and I was almost the youngest. I was fourth. And so I spent a lot of time with her. There were some, um, you know, challenges in my childhood and I spent time with her during those challenges. And um, I, since I was so young and the other, the, the fifth daughter came nine years later. So um, I just spent a lot of time with her and I was sort of amazed by her because she seemed to know everything. She could talk about killing rattlesnakes and she could make madeleines and um, had an opera coat in her closet and would tell me stories of being very poor and wearing gunny sacks for shoes and freezing in the winter and suffering through great fires and hailstorms and the locusts leveling the wheat fields. And, um, but then there was also, she drove this Lincoln Continental and she wore a diamond from Tiffany's and she was just this, you know, she was a, a, a kaleidoscope of, you know, fascination for me. Um, so I, I think there was something about, mm, I, I was drawn to these stories um, and, and I, I sort of never stopped. We just became very close. And, and um, I remember when she was, when she was, um, when she was dying, she, she told, she, she said that she, she was in a, not in a, a normal state for a minute. And she talked about the novel that she had written, Sweet Peas and Rattlesnakes, which was a, which was a title she, she always had wanted to write a novel. And um, I was actually just about to publish my first novel. And there was just something about storytelling that um, I think united us. Uh, my next question was actually about research. Um, but I have a, there's a, um, a question about research from one of our attendees. I'll read that one instead. It's sure. far better than mine. <laughs> uh, writing is such a process of discovery. This one's from Paula. Writing is such a process of discovery. How much research do you find yourself suddenly doing when taking on such an expansive timeline? And was there anything you discovered in your research that changed something about the structure or a character or a particular scene in the book? Well, um, mm, I don't know. Things definitely changed in the writing of this book. Um, but I don't know that it was through the research. I knew I, I, when I was took that sabbatical back in 2012 or whenever it was, I understood, I came to understand really fast that the structure for the book would be one chapter per decade. And I would try to tell a story around like one, almost like a short story. Um, it didn't quite turn out that way in the end because I, it, because I had a false start and I 
was too experimental in the beginning, trying something quite different. And um, so I, it took me three years to um, revise after I got to the end of the first draft. Um, but I will say that that research was so I, I had to reshape and, and reconceive the structure of the book, but that didn't have to do with the research. But research for me is it's it, it, it's fuels my imagination. It's, um, you know, I, I can't know what it's like to live in 1910. I haven't lived then. Um, and so or, or, or 1929, um, or, you know, or even today, you know, in Montana, I don't know what that's like. So you have to do research to understand that. And um, for me, it, it was about discovery, like the example I just gave of dis understanding that they probably went to Montana in 1910 because of the Enlarged Homestead Act. And learning stuff, um, like that and going down that rabbit hole and understanding what the railroads were doing that the land actually was desert in the the children's textbooks from a few years before the enlarged homestead act montana was described as desert and they went there the railroads were you know going across the country and they needed to populate populate it so it became it became fertile ground and um, so, you know, you, you learn, I, I learned a lot of stuff about, you know, dry farming technique and, um, and then I went like that across the, it, it, you know, became a little easier the closer we, we got to now. But um, no, I don't think that anything drastically shifted, but I was aware of the time I was, I was going through and I, and, and I was very, um, determined to to keep the life small just like we are our lives right now against the pandemic you know we have our ordinary situations with our families and and uh, and this is huge i mean uh, you know obviously um and we're all trying to go along and we don't even know but we're, we're still in our ordinary lives and so i i wanted to take i was aware of trying to keep that um, front and center in the research that I did. I would love to talk a little bit about um, your routine, your writing routine as a novelist, because I'm listening to you talk about all the research that you've done. How do you balance, sometimes you can get lost you know, in research, how do you balance the, the researching of a novel with the writing of the novel? Well, um, you, you, you I, I do enough to get going. I think it's, um, um, uh, you know, um, oh, I'm, the, the famous horror writer, Stephen King, um, said, you, you, you just have to um, know enough to make it look like you know what you're talking about. Right. So as soon as I feel like I know enough to make it look like I know what I'm talking about, <laughs> then I'm, I'm good to go. And usually I find something that I want to write about, you know, like the, the plows digging up gold, gold. It was an advertisement that, that exists. And I wanted to get that it, into the novel. So that it's usually a combination, but then I've done so much research that I don't, I don't need to do anything anymore. But my writing routine on a best day is to get up very early, four or five and write until the day is alive and, you know, it can be on a good day, it can be 11. And um, then I have the rest of the day in front of me. And when I get up uh, on those good days, and th they're not as often as I would like them to be, <laughs> I, have a cup of I have a cup of coffee, I read a little bit, I write in my journal, and then I get going. And, and then I can get completely lost. And it's a glorious feeling. You know, it's funny you say that not every day is is the best writing day, and I can certainly relate to that. Um, I'm often approached by aspiring writers um, when I do events, and they who also struggle they struggle with self doubt. Um, they think they're no good. They think they have no talent. And I always tell them um, a story that you told me way back when I was this was when I was your student. Um, we were talking about I was talking about how you know. 
I think everybody, I, I was feeling a lot of self-doubt. And your advice to me was, you know, everyone has, a lot of writers have this bird that sits on their shoulder as they're trying to write that tells them, you're no good. What are you trying to do? You have no talent. And your advice to me was that you just have to learn to sort of ignore that bird and keep writing, which is advice that I've taken very often in my career. Um, so my question, I guess, is, was that bird still on your shoulder as you were writing this that novel? That bird never leaves. That, <laughs> bird, that bird is like my best friend, um, <laughs> sort of, my friend to me. Um, uh, that was said to me from my very first writing teacher. And um, it, 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 Phil Schultz, um, back way at the beginning, and it, he called it your shit bird. And he, 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 the, the shit bird sits there and he pecks away at you. And yeah. he said, swat it off, swat it off. And, um, you know, uh, it, there, is, there is something about having that critic that is useful that's saying you're not good you you, you got to do better you got to do better you got to do better that um in a in a way can make you do better if you don't allow it to um just totally consume you and i have gotten into periods where i've been consumed and haven't been able to get away from that and i i, I feel like i've had to crawl out of a, a you know a deep dark hole and then you know do what you know what what i can to really keep it at bay because i've i've found my footing again um but the advice for young you know you, people who want to write of any age is to keep writing is to do it right um, as my father who's a writer says um write, writing teaches writing and i'd add read faulkner says read 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 anything read comics read trash read romance read literary fiction but but read and i'd add to that discipline because you know if you if you have uh, if if you can be disciplined um and and set aside a little bit of you know, set aside a time every day where you can do a little bit. It adds up. Mm -hmm. it does. We actually have a question from one of the attendees. Um, Melanie asks, it's related to the writing process. She says, can you talk about the revision process and at what point you feel like you know when it's done? Oh, that's the eternal question. It's, um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I could say I, I, I feel like it's never done. But I, I feel like this book is done. Um, and I, you know, I, it, it, for me, it was um, the, this final image in the novel that I, I got to. And um, uh, I, I felt like I understood the, the structure and I understood this. What I, I had said what I wanted to say. Like, I, I'm sure there are places where I can say it better. I'm sure that I, I could reduce it. I'm sure I could develop something here, that, that constant thing to make it better and better and better. But I, I feel that I have said it and I feel proud of it. And I feel, um, yeah, that I, I, I've explored the questions that, that launched the book in a way that's satisfying um, to me and I'm eager to move on with, I have three projects that are working um, and, and now my interest is going over there and perhaps that's the best barometer that my interest isn't here um, in terms of the writing process anymore. Are you starting a new novel? I have two actually that are going. Oh one, my gosh. one is almost finished and um, it just is, it needs to be revised. And then I have the memoir and this other one that I actually started um, a few years ago, um, which actually seems like it's the one I need to go to next because it has a lot in some ways to do with where we are right now. Um, so we'll see. Do you find, I mean, do you have to write one novel, one book at a time, I would imagine? Well, you know, this time I didn't. This time I was writing, you know, I, uh, An Elegant Woman, frustrated me a lot and I, I I would lose faith and I um I, I really had a hard struggle with it especially about three three or four years ago and so I I did um I started and I started these other projects along the way 
and some got further, you know, or further along than others, but yeah. Okay, we have another question for you from our audience. It says, hi, Martha, lovely to see you and everyone healthy and well. From your research, what did you choose to leave out of the novel and how did you make those choices? Mm. Um, well, um, the first draft of this book was very um, long. <laughs> it was six hundred pages, oh and gosh. yeah, it was. It, it, and it was. It was a far more. Um, well, it covered a lot more ground in terms of lives in the center of the book. So. Um, uh, the the grandmother's daughter's life and her husband's life and she has um, a very powerful love story in in her um, in her narrative and um, I you know I, I the book was too long and so I took all of that that stuff out it was all it was probably close to two hundred pages and um, and I actually uh decided it would become another novel and it's called Shahrazad and it's the one that's closest to to the end and so it's in a way it's a continuation of this story but from a very different perspective um not a different perspective but it's a very different story and uh, it's a love story and um but yeah so so it, that informed the structure the restructuring of, of the of the narrative okay we have another question um when you're writing fiction based on your own life or your family history do you ever pull back from including something that's too personal or revealing even if it's supposed to be fiction yes absolutely <laughs> Yes, I mean, this is not my first rodeo. I, I have, um, my first novel, you know, was about my parents' divorce, and in a way. Um, my, my second was about my stepfather's death. This is me just being really shorthand. Um, uh, but then they become these fictional other things, and, and um, they are novels, they're not memoirs. And, um, I, but yes, there, there are things that I didn't feel that I could explore there. You don't want to hurt anybody when you're doing this, you know, it's, although, um, Joan Didion said, if you don't want to hurt anybody, give up right now. <laughs> and so, you know, um, there is that, that line, but I've, I've, I've found ways, I believe, to not have to hurt anybody in this particular story. Um, there wasn't there wasn't anything that that I felt that I I couldn't explore. It's yeah. So, so I in, in I this particular story, was, everything was fair game. I mean, everything. Yeah, I mean, it was. I, I didn't feel that there was anything here that could hurt somebody. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, let's take another question. Let's see. It says uh, this is from Patricia. My question is about the start of the story. Did you know before you started writing how you wanted to start? And did the start substance, substantively change uh, by the final version? Yes, um, that's a good question because, um, so I, I told you that I had this, um, so this draft that didn't work out and that, that started with the two girls on the train, which is not a bad way to start, um, because it's it's a very you know it's it's dramatic. But I was trying to do something in this book with with voice and with being able to tell. It was it was hard to do because of all of the grandmothers, you know, ch changing stories and what's true and what isn't. And I needed an overarching narrator that wasn't the grandmother who could actually also go into other points of view and i came to that very late and and um i i always knew that i i wanted a first person i knew that i wanted the granddaughter to be a character and even in the early draft there were the the, fir the first person was there but it was um, a little sloppy and it it didn't have enough um control 
but I, I figured it out. Actually, a friend recommended um, The Stone Diaries by Carol Shields. I finished the novel in July. She um, recommended that in April, and the novel came together eight years of pain and suffering and misery and false starts and everything. April to July, wow. I read The Stone Diaries, and I mean, I'd already cut out the 200 pages. I'd done that, but I was um, really, you know, I, ha I hadn't nailed it. And I read that novel, and it just opened me up and uh, made me understand that I could, how I could use the first person, the third person, and how I, how my narrator could get inside these other points of view, but still have the overarching narrator be the the granddaughter, who's the one in control of how the narrative unspools. And that, so that, that happened fast and wow. it completely made, a, a, a created a new opening for me. And then so, from that moment, how long did it take you to finish the novel? Um, like I said, I, it, it, April to July, yeah. July, the, I, or yeah. at the end of June, I turned in the novel. Then we went away on a trip <laughs> and I came back and I did the revisions every morning getting up at you know 4 a.m for about four weeks and that was an exhilarating time you know there is there can be these payoffs and you must you know this in the writing like you it can be so hard and then it, it, there's this this just uh, this joyous wonderful moment of payoff and and that was that period from april to when we went on vacation and then when we came back to some, uh, early august with the revisions from the editor so yeah that was a, a fun time to remember oh that's wonderful okay we have a question from mark he says tell the story about the stuffed rabbit at the end of the book okay that is my husband <laughs> <very annoying. laughs> um, but it, it, there is a sort of uh, so we have a um we have a, some mutual friends who are also art art they're actors and um art artists and they and the guy and the husband is a contractor and he had this weird situation where um somebody had um a child had lost her stuffed animal a bunny and um the contractors were working on a kitchen in the house somewhere and they staple gunned the bunny to the wall and <laughs> the child came home and saw the bunny and was horrified and cried and was really upset and the um the the people said oh you've got to fire that contractor that's you know blah 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 and so they created a challenge where we had to put the the the, the bunny that scene in a, in a piece of work we were doing and i put it in toward the end and um that's what he's referring to <laughs> and and i i'm i'm only really answering it because um I mean, it's, it would be too long and involved to really explain it, but it, it is a great scene. And I hope you all buy the book and read <laughs> that scene. Um, and it, it's very tied into the grandmother. But what I love about it, it was the, you know, the, us just sitting around talking and the contractor, who's also an actor, coming up with this challenge. And it went into all of our work, um, into the, 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 playwrights work into my husband's poetry and ah. into my novel and these fun challenges are actually not a not a bad not a bad thing to do they're they're especially if if you're stuck or 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 looking to stir things up in the writing process throwing yourself a little curveball is um it can be a good thing that's a note to the to the young writers or the new writers well, we have a comment here. It says to please let you know that your um, she pre-ordered your book for her Kindle. Thank it you. comes out on her birthday, and she's also a graduate of Hofstra's MA in English Literature program. Oh. Um, I wanted to actually talk a little bit about actually that your other life as a professor. Um, if we can talk a little bit about how you do, you find inspiration also for your novel writing from your your teaching and from your students is there some symmetry there 
Yeah, definitely. I, you know, when I'm teaching, it's pretty hard to write in a sustained way because I'm very caught up in their stories. But I, I, I love the personal, the conference, the one-on-one -on -one conference. I love it because we're we're just riffing there. We're just trying to figure it out, and it's like, um, it's like uh, what ad libbing and what is that improv? It, it's right, improv. right. And um, I. I just find it exhilarating. And often I'll be in those um, conferences and I'll think, oh God, that's a good story. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> but I never have. I, I never have. But yes, I mean, that's one of the many pleasures of teaching is that you, um, you do have, you know, at its best, there's an exchange. And uh, like about a week ago, I, I talked about... Um, Learn. I gave a talk about keeping a journal, and um, it uh, was inspired really by a student, um, in part the way I keep my journal today. And so that kind of dialogue between um, teacher student, I, I think, is really is really rich and great for both when it's working at its best. Now you mentioned your journal. Um, you mentioned it at the very beginning of our chat, and you. I was wondering how much of those things that you jotted down in that journal from long ago made it into an elegant woman. Most of it. Really? Yeah, most of it. Um, there were. I was rereading them though recently, and there were a few things I had totally forgotten. Like my grandmother called her cats Pete and Repeat, and. <laughs> <laughs> little twin cats. I thought they were so, they were so funny. <laughs> Pete and repeat. And I, I don't know. I probably would have. That'll end up somewhere because it's, it, it's good. I mean, I just, I, I, I like the whimsy of it and the silly. <laughs> <laughs> now you said earlier that you don't consider yourself a memoirist necessarily. You're more of novelist. What is it about storytelling that attracts you? Would you say as opposed to well, fiction writing as opposed to? that Truth you don't writing. have to <laughs> adhere to facts, you yeah. know? I mean, you do, you know, you do if you're trying to render the landscape of, you know, 1910 Montana, you got to get your facts right. You don't want somebody to say, there are no palm trees, you know, you don't. Um, right, right. So th that you do, but I, 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 yeah, my dad is a factual writer and if the guy's wearing a red hat, he's got to be, when he interviews <laughs> him, he's got to be wearing a red hat and the quote has to come when the quote comes. Right. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm a, a lot looser than that and I like the, you know, I, I like where you can go with, um, with your, I like to be freer, I guess. I, I don't like the, um, I, my imagination, it's just the way my imagination works. I've, I'm always, my grandmother used to say, if I don't like something the way it is, I simply say it the way I'd rather it be. And um, that's how I sort of feel in terms of, you know, the fiction writing process. When did you know, though, when did you know that this was for you, that you were going to be a novelist? Well, um, I... That's a, uh, probably in my early 20s. I wanted to do it earlier, but I, I didn't, you know, I didn't think that I could. I didn't think I was talent. I, I had the talent. I didn't, I, th I was just little me, you know, and I, um, then I read, and what was my story? You know, I was in school, I was reading all the great men. And um, then I read uh, Mona Simpson's Anywhere But Here and um, Edna, um, O'Brien's The Country Girls Trilogy. And I thought, I, I want to do that. Those are, I have those stories to tell. And that's when I really knew that this is what I was, uh, you know, that I, I, I had stories to tell and I was going to tell them. Wow. And I was probably in my early 20s. Well, um, this was wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for today. And thank you everyone for joining us for this, this evening for a special edition of Hofstra University's Great Writers, Great Reading Series. Thank you to Martha for sharing your insights and also to Hofstra for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful event. Um, I'm going to put Martha's um, URL again in our chat. So if you're interested in pre-ordering an elegant woman, the URL should be right there for you. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, thank for you so much.
Thank you. Oh, Martha. sorry. Thank you. I, we're getting a lot of thank yous from the comments. Thank you. Take care. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Martha, have a wonderful evening. And um, be well and, and stay safe, everyone. Yes, thanks so much, Dina. This means the world to me. I love this. I love it. I loved your questions. Oh, thank you. This was stay, a joy. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.